All right, we've been pretty uh, pretty down the dumps, I think, on this podcast lately, just about developments in the pro golf world. Give me give me some kind of optimism. What what should I be optimistic about professional golf going forward? Oh, for sure. I think um, I think the, the 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 opportunities are really kind of crazy. I think fun and interesting, and I think golf. You know, I do. I am optimistic to the idea that golf will probably come back together. I do think within a few years. So I am optimistic about that. I think, I think the players want it. I think, um, I think the tours want it. It's just figuring out. There's all. I just. There's just so much to figure out now and figure out who's in charge, and you know who's going to make kind of that first move to say, okay, let's let's make this work. Let's make a partnership work that's in the best interest of the game of golf. Even though I don't. I've never been a fan of that slogan because I never know what the game of golf means, but you know, um, the best players in the world not playing together, um, 15, 20 weeks a year definitely doesn't make sense. Um, but I, I, you know, I share your sentiment. The last two years have been quite troubling. Um, but I, but I am excited about the players, um, that are coming up that are playing so well that we've seen, and from an international perspective and from a homegrown perspective, um, that it does feel like in the next few years, things will get, I think, slightly back to normal. But that's just my optimistic view. I don't have any, as you do or anyone else does, no one really knows what's going to happen. That's where I, I keep coming back to, even in your optimistic outlook there, of the golf world coming back together. I'm like, okay, well, that puts us back at, like, 2021, right? Which it, it's still – I didn't think things were trending that great at that point, and there's still some broken fundamentals that I don't know if just everyone coming back together solves it all, really. But I'm wondering kind of you being able to zoom out a little bit from the golf world, being, a, a, you know, a little bit removed from the game in terms of your your peak playing period and and uh, and not being in the, in the hustle on a week-to-week basis – how would you what what would your role if this happened in the peak of your career what would you be uh you know wanting to see happen what would you be like pining for um i would be pining for what i would want is some sort of control about who's going to run it's sort of like i look at it from like a college football perspective is that we have all these conferences and we've got the PGA of America we've got uh, the map, the masters. We got, we have all these great entities. We've, they're, they're all great. And it's got the SEC and they got the Big 12. We've got all these great entities and we have a great product. But we, it definitely feels like we have to come together a little bit more and figure out how do we do that? How do we do that efficiently? How does everyone happy? How do we get all the players, the best players in the world? How do we get a schedule that's maybe, you know, 10 months long? We, so the players do have two months off, right? So we're not competing with, football you know and and how, how do we kind of streamline this thing to where i do think like the european tour has a real purpose and they have real value how do we help them how, how does that because i always felt like when i joined the tour they were a force right in the 90s and in the 2000s they were a real force and that sort of situation between the european tour and the pj tour coming together for the Ryder cup that that is what made it so wonderful and so competitive and so interesting. Um, having so many guys now on this tour, it, it, I, I don't, I don't love where the European tour is going. I wish they had more stability. I wish they had more influx of, of, of money and economy to where they're, they become stronger. And, and um, so many of those great events are sort of going away now. Um, so like, I, I just wish that everyone was sort of get together in a way and figure out how do we do this? How do we create, a real tour of the best players in the world together and tour the, 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 the majors are highlighted and the, the PGA tour and the Europe and other tours are also highlighted throughout the year. That's why I feel like I've been rooting for the PGA tour just because it seems like the best option right now, you know, in terms of the best, it's where the, the players have, have convened the most together. Right. I think it has created, amongst its many flaws created the best possible competition in golf, the best available competition right now and diversifying the game has not been a good thing for it and further diversifying is not a good thing i think i keep coming back to like if if they're really going to this for-profit model which i i i'm 
as soon as I start talking about that, I'm venturing into territory where I'm pretty uncomfortable with my knowledge of it. I was pretty confident in the signature event thing and like, hey, let's get the best players on the on the field on the course at the same time. That's gonna be great for golf. That's pretty easy to understand. Now, when you get into this for profit thing, I struggle to understand how the PGA Tour goes back to looking at all what it looks like now and how we don't end up with some kind of global tour on top of the the PGA tour and the DP world tour. Um, I, I, again, I don't know how that works, but I think kind of what you're talking about there is pretty similar to that. I think so. I, I, I um, and the, and that other layer of this is there's so much trust has been broken. I think between the players and the management, right. And, like I said, you almost have to, for as scary as it sounds, sort of tear it down and, and rebuild it. And I think that's the unfortunate truth to this is what has been can no longer keep going as it was. It's just business as usual. I just don't think the players, I don't think the players want that. And 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 I would not want that playing now. I'd say I, I just, we just need our own representation in there to have conversations with these people and not have you know, like the end, you know, um, Ari Emanuel's company coming in and they put a bid and, and they, they rejected it. And it's like, well, who rejected that? Did the players get the players get their team into that and figure out what that is, what that means? Or is it just Jay has power to say no? You know, I, I mean, I think there's so many more questions as a player um, that you want to have now. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, your your eyes are wide open to the reality of what's going on behind the scenes without your knowledge. And that's I think that's an uncomfortable thing and and in this world of uh player empowerment and almost in all sports this is like a real situation where the players are not really it's not even being listened to they're not even get, getting to hear any of these conversations and so that's really concerning um if i'm a player and i i do think the reality is you just have to tear this thing down a little bit and you're gonna have to hire someone with real business experience and real entertainment experience to figure out what is the best way to have this global brand be utilized? It's not an easy thing. Um, I still think like the NBA and the NFL, this is where the best players come, the NHL and, and so forth. Like this is where the, the best players come, but there's still a role for, you know, the, the Asian tour, the European tour. And I think a strong European tour helps the PGA tour and helps all those events. So um, I, I that's feels like the reality to this thing is this, we kind of have to tear it to the ground now and figure out what's who's going to lead it and who's going to be in charge. And everyone has to feel comfortable with that. I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because I, there's what I, I, this is not me saying that leadership has done a good job here. Cause I, that's not the reaction. It's not the gut feeling I have, but it's also to say, I don't know if the answer is turning over more power to the players. Like I've read a lot of quotes from players about how to handle this stuff. And, a lot of the players out on tour are extremely, extremely good at getting golf balls into the hole. Yeah. I do not trust their business experience to to be able to, you know, go sift through the Ari Emanuel deal to to make the right decision there, right? No. So, but that doesn't mean that the you know that you're not exactly correct to say that the players shouldn't be trusting the current leadership that has gotten them into kind of this debacle as well. So it's it's tricky. It's a it's a representation thing. It's right. not a player run thing. It's just players have to say okay. Who is gonna? Who's speaking for us? We have can to I, have someone can I to be pause able on to this? speak for yeah. us. I want to pause on this though because, like, this is where I get really disconnected. Of and, and again, when you talk to players on this, like, it is all about players, right? But it, me as a fan can hold my hand up and say, like, hey, what's maybe in the player's best interest or the 50th ranked player, the 75th ranked player, the 100th ranked player, 150th ranked player? What's in that player's best interest might be very different than what is in me as the fan's interest and the sport as a whole's interest, right? So the way the tour is run, the way decisions are made is based off this membership kind of, you know, you know, platform that like the, the guys that are put in charge are there to serve the players, right? So yeah, yeah. they're doing all they can to help grow the pie, grow the game. That's why you hear grow the game so often to bring in media interest and all that. But it's their hands are tied in a lot of ways because of they got to put up tournaments. They got to put up starts. They And you end up with this really jumbled product where you kind of aren't really delivering for the fan. And yes, the players are getting paid, but how much can the game grow? That's kind of where I'm struggling with where the future really goes. Yeah, and I don't I don't disagree um, with the concept of of where where does you know, and that's why, you know, you need someone who with an, I feel like some sort of entertainment business background to understand 
you know, how do we um, profit from all these things? How do we, you know, squeeze the most out of juice without taking away from um, the fan experience? Um, how do we use technology? Which technology is, is I think, is is maybe not helping the, the entertainment sector of, of in certain areas, but I think in sports, it's more popular and more, um, I think it has more power than ever to have live sports, live drama. That's what people really will tune into. Um, how do we do a better job of that? How do we do a better job of taking a player and, and a fan saying, I, I want to watch this player. I don't want, I don't care about all the other players right now. Cause I love this guy. I love John Rahm. I want to see him. I want that, you know, how does Spain get to watch all of John Rahm? Right. And so there's such a great international component to the game of golf that um, definitely doesn't feel utilized as, as well. It should. Um, I always will go back to, I, I, it's not as if I want player run, things i just want there has to be some sort of player run there has to be some sort of player representation sure. in there that they hire that, that that they feel good about someone going in there and i know it's like and everyone always chirps that well it's a union you can't do that and it's like to me the rules are done like i don't that care about any of these rules it's Throw over. It out. like yeah. we're doing whatever we want now at this point because we've seen bad leadership and just bad decisions over the past few years and what it's sort of left and and it's a, just a fractured um situation and there were so many mistakes made that are mistakes that have, should have never happened that that really if i'm a player really make me nervous about the future about what we're doing and as a player and this rory rory is a good example of someone who's been on the forefront of these things but now he's taking a step back because clearly he's like i'm not uh, capable of doing all this i just i'm just a golfer and he's a guy who wants to be in those conversations and wants to be there and now he's like i'm done i can't i can't deal with this i can't be the best golfer that i can be which is what i'm here to do and then sort of help facilitate and be sort of a uh you know he seems like he's kind of in between the players and the tour trying to you know speak for everyone and i don't think he does and i think he's feeling that and that responsibility and um so it's it's definitely a mess and it's definitely a mess of who's in charge and everyone pointing the finger at someone else and no one's really you know has nobody really has a real understanding of what to do that's for sure when you refer to mistake like clear mistakes that are made what, what are the first things that come to mind to say even with the benefit of hindsight we can look back and say like hey these this was a mistake this was a mistake this was a mistake what, what's the leading candidates there well, in, I mean, the I, I remember um, being at a meeting years and years and years ago with with Jay, and there was rumors of uh, I think it was a you know a, um, a group from like New York had was was thinking about launching a tour. Uh, it was just it was in the air, right? It was it wasn't really a competitive tour, but it was something around, and it was they were circling and they were talking to players and stuff. Um, and he came out in this meeting like talking to you know like a bunch of children like you will not do this you have no right um talking down to the players and it was a, just it was a very aggressive um uh, meeting and you have you will be kicked off the tour you will never be back on, let back on um you've suspended indefinitely if we hear of any names coming out and it was such a strange uh sort of conversation um and it was far from the you know this is a membership group where the players are in charge it was a you will do what you're told and you have no right to leave it was i thought it was just a, such a strange feeling and such a strange meeting and strange message for everybody um it didn't give you any sort of confidence or, or understanding what was happening and then you know the the, the rumors of live coming up um, having no conversations with them, having no understanding of what they're doing, just to just to maybe understand what they're doing, not to take a meeting. I talked to plenty of people, and I know players have too, where like, at the very least, you take a meeting just to get a sense of what is happening, what, what do you think they want to do, and where they want to go with the game. And the reality is if they had a couple billion dollars they want to influx in the game of golf, you probably had to put your personal feelings aside and actually say, okay, this is a really interesting big opportunity um and, and talk about it and, and and then maybe say maybe say no but to not have a meeting and then everything that transpired afterwards was just a, a sort of a debacle and it, it it put the players in a really bad spot and that's of all the things that happened 
to put the players in this situation is is sort of when I look at it is is was the biggest problem. I mean, they just they put them out there in front of the sort of in front of the media and they're standing there every week and Rory and Jordan, they're all talking about it. And it's just like, this is not their job. Like you can't expect them to play golf, produce, entertain, and then some be the PR stunt. Like that's not fair. They did not deserve that. They, they did what you wanted. And then at the end, you just completely caved. And then you just, you, you backstabbed every one of them. It just was so not fair for all the players and what they did it just just it just wasn't right yeah and on top of that it's it was a, a deal that you know even the, the an intro level uh attorney a, a second year associate would say hey there might be some antitrust concerns here well, uh department of justice is gonna yeah love this. and now we're going like it's just like what is going you know it's just you're just so confused about everything that's going on and it's just like i said the players being put in this position to where they have to do they're in charge of everything yet somehow they don't have they're not have the right to look at the deal or to understand what's going on years ago and then it's just like wait a minute you can't have it both ways you can't say it's your tour and then say um you don't actually have a say in what what we're doing right you get a vote but you know it's pretty clear those votes don't really mean much Right, the the policy board votes are the only ones that really count, right? What, what is that? You know, yeah. it's sort of like what you know, and and it just feels like everyone's over their head now. Yep. Um, well, that's enough on the depressing stuff. Why don't we talk about the the U.S. Ryder Cup team then? Um, <laughs> Wait, well, that's not depressing. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I've I've mentioned this on the on the pod a couple of times, but you and I uh, we we're on the same flight, I think, back from uh, from Rome, and we caught up in the in the Philly airport, and it, the passion was burning coming off that flight, and it hasn't really died down for me. I hope it hasn't died down for you in terms of of the path forward here. Before we get into that, though, what was you you were over there doing some some commentary for Sky Sports? Uh, how did that come about? What was what's that experience like? And uh, will we see you maybe more in broadcasting? Well, it was for the world feed, actually, not the Sky Sports. It's 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 funny over there. There's a lot of a lot of I actually did for Sky Sports um, a few years prior to Hazel Team. That's right. They asked me to do it, and then they asked me to do it uh, whistling straights. Um, and then the European Tour Productions called me to do it for for Rome. And um, the the Ryder Cup is what it's what I watched as a kid. And that's what got me so excited, like that and the Masters. But the Ryder Cup, the, the 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 team aspect of that, and the passion you saw from the players and the captains and the fans, and the, the all the emotion from it was what I loved. And so, uh, being a part of it as I was um, was so special to me. And those are the things that I I, I keep dear with me and uh, I love so much. So whenever I'm asked to do it, I always say yes because I can't wait to be a part of that in some sort of capacity. So they called me and asked me to do it. Um, and they wanted my perspective from being an American player, being a European tour production. They thought that would be a nice balance to what, what they're talking about in the world feed and everything. And so um, it was great. They allowed me to be a fan. They allowed me to be, you know, sort of a, a part of uh, the U.S. side in a good way. But, you know, I, I did my best to just be very um, uh, transparent to what the information was providing me and how things were going. Right. And so um, it was it was really neat. Um to see it because it felt you know that that different lens you know watching like hazeltine and whistling straights and stuff um and then being on their soil and watching it was completely different perspective and it seemed very obvious to um sort of what the problems were and how how we looked and how you know i you know i talked to um a couple of players afterwards and and, and what I felt was what was happening, right? And we sort of saw it too. Um, everything going on was not was not great. So um, it was, um, you know, it was. It's still a special event. It was still super cool. But the ending, obviously, and, and how things transpired was very was very frustrating. Um, and we had a great talk about it in the airport. Um, uh, I don't want to ramble on too much. I'm no, I'm gonna I'm, we're yeah. gonna get you for for everything here. We're gonna get it all out of you here. Yeah. So, I, so, so you know. So go ahead. So go well, ahead. I was gonna say it, it, I was confident, not cocky, <laughs> going into this. I, I I thought this group was different. I thought this was gonna be a changing of the guard. I thought they figured something out at Whistling Straits that was gonna help carry over to this one. Uh, that would ultimately get proven wrong, but. 
you've been a part of multiple teams that have crossed over and you've, you know, you've been a fan of golf for a long time. This has happened now seven straight times. What were your expectations going into this, right? I kept believing they could overcome this travel to Europe thing, but were you wary of their chances at all going into it? Um, well, they're such good players, right? Like when you really sit down and look at the team, like they're, they're just so good. You wouldn't think that what happened could happen. Um, but they, you know, and I think even Zach admitted to this, that time got the best of him. Actually, he said recently. And and it's amazing how unprepared you can be for something that you have sort of two years to prepare for. And he had all these assistant captains with him who have been captains before, multiple, multiple times. All this experience. And at the end of the day, they weren't, the reality is they weren't prepared. And that's crazy to think, but I think that's the very simple, basic truth to this. Um, they got there. They had that practice session sort of, um, and it was too late in the schedule to fly there, the fly back, and then fly there again within like a couple weeks of each other. Didn't really make any sense. Um, they got there too late. They got there like on Monday. What are you doing? Um, didn't make any sense. Um, they were... Um, I heard they were, they didn't really have great pairings. They just were sort of like very analytical with the pairings. Um, and they had like, they had no plan B. They had no plan C. They had no plan D. It was sort of like, well, this is what we're going to do and hope it works. And it just, they looked like they were cramming for a test out there and they didn't look comfortable at all. Um, I think the Europeans, and I think you had um, uh, the Europeans, were ready. They just looked so prepared and they were so ready. And, and, you know, um, it, you know, it, there's just, I think there's so many things that go into this playing on the road is a real difference maker. And we've seen that. And people keep thinking like, well, we've got to change things. It's, it's like, you don't, you don't have to change anything. Like, it's just, it's such a different mindset of traveling and being on the road in this event, because you're not used to it at all. So if you're a captain, you have to go talk to, um, you have to go talk to a Michael Jordan or, or Justin Thomas's connection with Nick Saban, like talk to Nick Saban and say, how do you go to Auburn and get your team motivated and prepared for that environment? Because it's, this is not much different. It's just really not. Um, when you're there, you were there. It's a completely different energy than when you are in the States, right? And you need a different sort of energy from your captain and your leadership that week because you have to create the energy. The energy is not there. It's really easy in Hazeltine and Whistling Straits to have energy and to have um, sort of that focus and desire and the passion from the fans. It's all, it's everywhere. You have to tone it down mm-hmm. if you're in that room. When you go there, you need to create it. And you need to create it the moment you get there. And they should have gotten there five days earlier. Wow. They should have really gotten there way, way earlier, got acclimated by the weekend they could start really preparing and practicing and playing. But then even before that, I think they're waiting too long to get their pairings and they're not trusting their better players. They're not trusting um, a Scotty Shuffler to go out there and, and, you know, say, okay, we might pair you with Sam, but I want you to take a look at, you know, another guy. I want you to talk to Brian Harmon. Max, I want you to talk to Brian Harmon. I want you to talk to Sam Burns. I want you, I want, we need to start circulating these partnerships way earlier and really talking and really starting to get these guys to buy into each other and figure out, okay, this is our little web of two to three guys that you might play with and and so on and so forth. We've been so enamored with our guys and like Justin and Jordan together that they have no other parents. Like they have nobody else they play with. Like Jordan just wasn't in good form. He was having a second baby. He just was, it was, it was distracted and he just wasn't going to be there the way he usually would be. And he played too much, right? He should have, but, but Justin's like, well, he's my guy. I, I got to yeah. play with him. He had no other pairing. Like, how do you not have another pairing? How are you not prepared for this? Everything felt crammed and they just weren't ready. And we keep talking about having, um, a tight group and there's that, that coercion and the Europeans are, are much tighter and 
And in the reality is it's true. It's 100% true. They have a much better plan and understanding of how they're going to have to come together as a team. And people think it's about having a good time and, and, and putting your arm around the guy. It's not. It's about partnerships. It's about who are you going to roll out there with and how much have these guys been working with one another? Clearly, the European side, they've been working on these partnerships for a really, really long time to where these guys came together. They've known each other. You know, they, they, you could just tell that there was this vibe between them that they know exactly what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And there's a rhythm to what they're doing. And I mean, that morning session for as much as it's like, well, there's a lot of time left. It was really over after that, that four, nothing. I mean, it was done. I mean, and that's a crazy, thing, but it was, you saw it right on, you saw it on, on, on the faces of the European squad. They were so prepared and so ready. And our guys looked like they just, they were still getting acclimated to the situation. And by the time there was emotion and then Patrick came through and there was some fire, it's a Saturday afternoon. It's over. Yeah. Like, like you have to create energy and emotion throughout the whole week. And it was like, they were, they just weren't concerned about that. They were more concerned about sort of bonding and like the bonding is irrelevant. Like nobody cares. I don't think they know how to bond. I, I think they, they think, you know, they kept saying we're the closest team ever and all that, but it's, 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 that's not, that's not what inspires great golf. And I, that's what I want to no. pick your brain on too. Like the blueprint is out there, right? I mean, the Europeans oh. have, have, have well documented their approach. And I, I guess I bought in a little too much to what Padraig Harrington said after whistling straights, like they've copied everything we've done. Our advantage is gone. Like I, I just, yeah. I bought into that. I was like, oh, I totally believe now that, the U.S. Has, has figured this thing out. This is a totally different crew that doesn't have the scar tissue about going over there and all this. And then, mm -hmm. like, you get up the press conference afterward, and Speed says, yeah, they just kind of, like, made more putts and chipped in more than we did. And I'm like, bro, that's not what just happened. And it just seems like I I'm so, so impressed with how Rory and how Rom specifically, just 100%, 1,000% going into the week like their the name on the back of the jersey before they enter that team room, they throw that jersey in a hamper in the corner, and then they're like they wear the Team Europe uniform like from the jump, from yeah. the absolute onset. If if some uh, captain came to Rory and said, "Hey, you're only going to play in foursomes uh, at the in the team match, and this is what I need you to do," he'd be like, "Okay, I'll do it." And the U.S. seems to have none of that vibe. Not only do they not have the captains that are willing to like set the tone on this they don't have the guys that seem willing to buy in on any of this it seems really far away uh for me um i don't know like i um i don't know if it, if it's they don't have the guys to buy in i do think i think it's fair to say that these guys think about the Ryder cup all the time i think rory and rom this is why rom will never go to live like is that he is too invested in the in, in the Ryder Cup, right? Like there was rumors of him, and it's like he's not he's not going. He has a legacy he wants to like Sevi created um this legacy for Spanish players that he's not gonna just throw away. Like he he wants to really build something. Um you can tell how much it means to them to play in the Ryder Cup because they're not representing themselves. They're representing the people before them, right? Like they have, they rolled that Seve yes. poster down. And it's it, so real. It's so I real. It, and I'm like, wow. Like being over there, you get chills. I get chills just thinking about it. Like he is, you know, we, you know, in sports, we talk about all the time about, you know, the, um, you know, the pillars of the game, right? And, 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 um, uh, who inspired and, and who are the architects? Sevi is an architect of European golf. He is the man. He is he is the Nicholas the Palmer. Like he's even more than that to them. And so he inspired a whole generation of of players and stuff. And you see that in their face. And um that's what I feel like Paul did for us. Like there was an inspirational aspect to him. He had a, a he, he had a player. He gave ownership to these groups, to 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 Phil and to Furyk and, and and to Boo and all these guys. He just said, "Man, these are your. This is your team. This isn't my team. This is your team. I'm just putting you out there because I trust and believe in you, and I can't wait for you to go out and play." 
you want to talk about inspirational and motivational and so excited to go out there and do it. Um, that's why we were so successful that week. We were completely outmanned that week. You know, we didn't have Tiger. Um, it was a rookie heavy team and they were in the peaks of their European powers, man. They were going to come over and dominate us. I mean, you're talking Sergio and Lee and, and Robert Carlson was unbelievable. And Henrik Stenson was playing great. There was just, they were just dudes everywhere on that team. And we just stomped them into the ground because we knew we were just so inspired and so motivated and everyone was together. And we were, it wasn't 12 guys together. We were just these little groups together. And we knew exactly like who we were going to play with all week. There was no, there, there was no guessing. It was already built into what we were doing. And, and that plan has not been reformulated again. It has been almost pushed to the side because no one wants to do that again because it had a, a catchy name. It didn't have, and, and, and the reality is the name of it is just um, creating an inspirational area for you to go out there and win because that's the whole point of it is to go out there and play great and play inspired and play motivated. And that's what I didn't see from our guys was they were, they didn't look inspired. They didn't look like, they just didn't look like they were nearly at the level. Like Europe was at a, was here and we were just playing down here and it's because they weren't asked to, to get there. Scotty Scheffler wasn't asked to be more than a golfer that week. Yes. I need you to like, in the reality, it's months earlier, you know, I love Zach to death. He's one of the best people that I know, but he needed to go to Scotty and say, Scotty, I need you to play great that week. That's obvious, but I need more than that. I need way more than that. I need inspiration from you. I need inspiration from Jordan. I'm going to need inspiration from all these guys on the team. You're going to be in charge of this group. I'm going to put you in charge of these guys. You know, it's not going to be team captains. I don't need a team. I don't, I love Steve Stricker. It's not inspiring anybody, right? Like I need inspiration from you. I need you to motivate these guys. I need you to take charge of this group, you know? And I just don't think that was asked of them. They were more concerned about, you know, bonding and hanging out. And these are all good guys. Like it, it and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about winning the Ryder Cup. We're not talking about bonding. You know, and Zach was like, I love these guys, and we had a great crew. And and the reality is they didn't they they did have a great crew, but it was not a great, you know, they were they were fractured a little bit. And we found out about that later. And that was really unfortunate because I think most of those guys are are there they are there to win and to be a part of it, but they're just, you know, there's such a responsibility the European players feel from the players, um, the, the players that sort of set the tone years and years and goes. And there's a responsibility that they believe to take it to the next one, to play great and be great and be more than just a great golfer that week. It, it's culture, man. It's it, you're talking about somebody that just harvests some 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 kind of culture, and I, I refer to this all the time. Shane Ryan did a great series, of, does a great series of podcasts for Golf Digest called the I think it's called the Ryder Cup Run. It might have been rebranded, but he has an episode about 1983 or 1985. I forget which one it is. And it if you want to talk about the Seve stuff, like Seve, and I don't have the exact quotes, but in 1983 they at uh, it um, down in Palm Beach, the Ryder Cup. They had the closest. Ryder Cup ever in the modern era in the U.S. Uh, on the U.S. turf, and the, the team was pretty devastated afterwards. And Sevy like got him in the locker room. Like everybody's devastated and crying. He's like, "This is a victory for us. Like this is the best we've yeah. ever done, and we will win in 1985. Like when we they we go to the Belfry, we will win. And like that's how that night ended was in celebration. And like, and from that moment on, like if you want to talk about, we had Eduardo Molinari on talking about, uh, you know this past week and like set, Jose Muriel Alfabo said, I would trade in one of my green jackets to play in one more Ryder cup. Like that traces all the way back to the, creating a buy-in back in the eighties that has permeated through that team uh, since then and has never, the U S has had some success in short bursts, but that has never been harvested or led by anyone. The one instance you're referring to, there was just no rollover from Azinger into, into 2010. And that kind of feel was lost. And, um, it's real. And I, I just, I, I, I can't ask enough people about how explaining like, all right, being inspired. I imagine I've not played in one of these yet. I'm working on it, but, uh, I imagine 
you can't just like listen to Metallica and go get pumped up and like go play amazing golf, right? It's not an adrenaline test. It's not like who can get the most jacked up to play. What does inspiration mean? How does it help you play better golf? Well, I think that, you know, what, what Paul did a really good job of, it was a slow bleed, right? It wasn't, it wasn't that week of running through a wall. It was Phil sat me down after I got picked. He sat me down at, I think it was a, it was like a playoff event or something. And he went through this whole list. He said, we're going to win. And let me tell you why. And he went through this whole list. And I, I think I told the Golf Digest guys how important Phil was. And Phil kept a lot of these teams together um, in a lot of different ways because he is very inspiring. And he's not inspiring by, um, um, you know, running through a wall or, 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 or banging tables or, or any sort of speeches. He really cares. And they, they, the Europeans, they care about this event more than when, when, when they say that, when Malonari says that, he says, I would happily give up whatever to, to play one more, to be a part of it, right? Like that, I mean, they believe that, they mean that. And you have to just really, really, you have to get the players to get ownership of the team. You can't just be the leader of them. They have, it's like uh, the thing that Paul did was that he was just so energized and so excited about the opportunity and he brought in the people and the fans. You don't get that over there. So you have to kind of create it. But the reality is you've got to put it on the players and say, you know, find little groups and little pods of, of, of them. You know, people hated the pod thing, but the reason why it worked is because you're not out there as, you know, you can't, 12 people can't bond that week, but you need to give the players ownership and say, this is your team. We're all going to need to help spire each other. Um, and it has to be this bleed of, of, of continuous motivation throughout that whole year and keep everyone's minds kind of uh, invested in it the whole time. Right. Yeah. It, it can't, it's not a one week thing. Europe's do this all year, right? They get, they get the players and they, and they call the European tour says, get these, I want these guys together. And they need to pair, they need to be playing together. They need to see how they play. They need to get a feel for one another. So when we go to that week, everything is laid out and the thinking and the process is done. They just go play and they go play aggressive and they go get it. Right. And so the, it, it, man, it has to be a big plan and it has to have all these little, you know, checkpoints of where you're getting everybody bought in and get everybody on the exact same page about what they're going to do and they're, how they're going to do things. And the way that we look, going back to it, they had this random trip. They just went there like three weeks beforehand and then they came back and then they're home for two weeks and then they flew there again and then they flew kind of late. It was like none of this was planned. I think they just were focusing on the wrong things. Um, and there's just an unfortunate um you know club of guys who are just when you just start circling the same stuff over and over and over again it seems to you think it's going to work at home as it's going to work the same as it's there it's not it's a completely different animal it's just completely different and you have to respect that and you have to know that and you have to understand that and if you don't even get to that point which i don't think anyone really has in a long time it, you're gonna you're in a rough rough spot and i think the European side has sort of figured that out and said, okay, our, our, our abilities are right here now. Before, there was, they were never. Now, our abilities are right here. We've got the players. We've got the youth. We've got guys coming up. So now we have to bring that inspiration, that energy. And that's what Luke did, and that's what Rory did when they said, we're going to go to uh, Bethpage, and we're going to win. That's what they're doing. They're already inspiring. And they already started again and said, this is what we're going to do. And I, th I thought it was fantastic what they did. I thought it was exactly the right thing to do. And they're inspiring those younger guys who played and the guys maybe who just missed out on making that team to be a part of that. And I thought that was very, very cool. And I thought that was exactly the right thing to do. Yeah. And this is where I get, again, can, can twist my brain into a pretzel. Like, all right, Medina <laughs> was the freakiest incident ever. And I... Yes. There's some sure. stock I put it. There's some things that led to that, but I mean, in reality, though, the home team has dominated yes. basically going back to 2006, right? Yeah. So, uh, as as great as Europeans' process is, like 
they lost by the widest margin ever in the in the modern Ryder Cup uh, the last time it was in the U.S. and they got spanked at Hazeltine, right? So like you can do yeah. all of these things, create this culture and all that, and still get your ass whooped. If you don't, if you don't have the players, like the I talent, was there, yeah. we didn't have the players. They just didn't. It was just yeah. one of those kind of crazy years. In the U.S., it was just like the U.S. was. Everyone was at the peak of their powers, and they were just playing good too. Like it wasn't just like they were they had the better players; they were all ridiculous. Like the Presidents Cup, sort of last year, it was like this is a ridiculous team, and they're playing unbelievable right now. And and so that was kind of a freak occurrence, and that happens. And and then the European was like they went through a little bit of a change, but now it does feel like they are. It's it's different going forward. They've got some they've got some studs, and that's where I guess I, I get, I'm probably putting too much stock in the post press conference and all that but you know we just had witnessed scotty scheffler in tears you know the day before and like obviously going through kind of emotions on a golf course that he I, we've never seen him go through or probably has never he's, never he's never been through that he has no like that was a it's hard to describe because the Ryder cup brings so much to you that you didn't know you had in you and it's hard to like he's like i've never felt like that before and then of course like you lose you play bad but it's like he couldn't put it into words like the, the emotion is all he had left and it was like and um that's what's crazy and, and amazing about the Ryder cup and makes it so makes it the event that it is but that's where again i'm I, i'm putting too much stock in it and maybe I, I should give them more leeway to to get a little time and perspective on this to pull back and come up with a plan <laughs> but i didn't see like that that whole thing that that kind of mindset of like all right we know what we went what went wrong here and like we're fired up to go fix this going into the next Ryder cups it just kind of i they're kind of throwing their hands up still at the I, I don't know how many times we can go do this play over there and lose and just be like well we needed to play better like hey maybe there's a lot of things in the process that need to change that it, it, you know that lead to the US players playing better over there and i it sure sounds to me and it sounded like to me when we in that conversation in the airport it sounded like you have some interest potentially in getting involved in these teams and you're laying out a blueprint for for turning this thing around would you want to uh be involved in in u.s teams in some capacity well that'd be great obviously um it's something near and dear to my heart and and i love it i mean i don't i don't know if i'm um you know in the game that way i need to be to be a part of the team but um I would love to be you know, a part of it in any way I can. Hopefully I can just commentate if I, if the very least uh, do it. But, but I, I will say is like the perspective that I had was so interesting and it was so different than being um, at home and being on the road and seeing it and actually watching it um, and, and sort of hearing about what was going on. It gave you a very clear reasoning why they didn't play well. And why the European played so well, right? Like another reason was the European, a lot of the guys have played that golf course multiple times. The US side never went there and they never, they didn't play it in a, an event, right? And the Europeans have been coming there for years. You know, Rory's been there and, and um, uh, they had a couple of guys who have won there in the past. So um, who was um, Matthew Fitzpatrick played there, played well. So like they had a bunch of guys play there. They like, like I said, the reality is they just wanted it more and they were willing to do things. You could say you want to win, but what are you willing to do to win? The European side is willing to do more to win. And they did. They went there and they played and they played multiple years to get used to that golf course and see it from a tournament perspective, which is very different than just playing practice rounds. Right. Um, they changed the course quite a bit to fit their needs, which I actually, just, I really do like and, and like how they like how the home team has control of that. Um, but it is the, you know, it is the um, opposing side to figure out, you know, maybe the things they can do and figure out how do we, uh, how, how are we going to play this golf course to, to our needs and to fit our needs and, and, and do what we need to do. So they did a masterful job of setting up the golf course to the European side. Um, and then they did go out and, 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 and play great. There's no doubt about it. But the reality is they were just way more prepared than the U.S. side. Wait, I mean, that thing felt over before when you watch that, like one session into this thing, it was very clear that they were, they just were prepared for everything that was coming their way. And, and they just looked like they had absolutely no fear about the end result because it was already, you know, it was already determined. It's one of those things too. I don't know how many times I have to learn this lesson, but I, uh, somebody who was close to the situation had told me like, you should go see 
the European team room and the US team room, like the the level of investment that the teams have put into this, like the, yeah. the, the, the little actual structures, like the actual the actual rooms and yeah. the level of detail. And that's all you need to know to about like how prepared these teams are. And I was like, ah, that was early, the early part of the week. I'm like, yeah, that's not worth any points. Like, yeah, let's yeah. go play. The, and then it's like, oh shit, man. Then maybe there, uh, maybe there is something to to how they have this whole approach to it and, and all that, but. Um, I don't know. It's fast. It's endlessly fascinating for me. I, uh, um, I, 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 I looked into the camera and said, I'm not going to predict them to ever win in Europe until they actually do it. Like I just, I'll miss the first <laughs> one they do just cause it's like, if it, I don't know, that one felt like it, it should have been, I, I, I think I'm good on, I think I'm good on the home team setup. I, I don't know if that needs to be a continue. Like there's so much already working in the home team's favor uh, you know, and they didn't like overly manipulate the course, but it was just set up to the point where it's like, all right, we're not going to have wedge shots into this, into these greens yeah. because Zero. that's where the U.S. has an advantage. Zero. I'm like, ah, man, I kind of think the Ryder Cup should be like a test of overall skills and not just the test of all the things that only benefit <laughs> you. Uh, it'd be, I don't know. It's like tilting a basketball court in your direction. You know, I, I, I don't know the perfect analogy here other than to say like, it just seems like one step too far because we've had way too many home blowouts. It, it, I think I think it's okay if you do it. You just have to have some sort of time before it. You should give a little bit, like two months or three months or whatever. There, there should be some sort of like, hey, we're going to set it up this way. Yeah, and then you should have time to adjust. It feels like if you do if you do it like you have no idea where the tees are, right? And there were so many tee boxes there on those holes, right? And they took all the par fours and if they're even remotely reachable, they're going to be drivers. We're just going to make it. So we're not going to have any wedge shots, right? All the par fives are going to be reachable. So we're not going to have any wedge shots. As you said, There's they were they were basically mid to long par fours and then drivable par, and then drivable yeah. par fours. And then a couple of reachable par fives. There was never an opportunity for players to hit wedges, right? And then good par threes and stuff. So... They did a good job. I guess the only thing you could say is like you have to kind of set it up and then that week of say this is where the tee boxes are going to be. Yeah. So you can play that, right, to kind of unload that on Friday and then see it. It, it does – there is a little trickeration to that. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's – yeah, I could go both ways on that. Um no but, one wants to be the first team to give up the the home the home advantage, right? It's uh, no, it's a, hard <laughs> thing. it's a hard thing to give up, right? Because you get control, and and there there is a difference. There is a difference in, in, in the players, but um, but for the European side, for sure, because they can go to these golf courses that the the and they have more control over the tour itself. For sure, so they can the course is going to be there. They can have a tournament there, right? And they can set it up for the next two years. And so their guys play. It's on the U.S. side to go over there. And to play, right? Like there was an open invitation, I'm sure, to all those players to go play that event for the last two years, and nobody said yes. So that's that is on the players. To, they have to do that, right? And so, um, um, and it's going to be harder. Like I, you know, I did talk to Spieth, and he's like, "Boy, we had a real opportunity in in, in France and in Italy. We're going to Ireland. It's going to be way harder over there for us to win." That is going to be a completely different animal because you didn't get the fans, right? Those European fans, the way you're going to get them, the, those the Great Britain Ireland fans are coming, and it's going to be ruckus. And so, you know, that's going to be really, really, really tough, especially really. off the backs of Beth Page, which we know is yes. like they're going to want some. Which, regardless of the result, like they're going to want some revenge fan crowd wise. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be rough. I mean, it's going to be a really, really rough week. So that's you know. I've suggested that they should go with Tiger um, as the next captain, and then the captain after that. So do it for sure. four years. That's what I think should be done. Uh, it should be the plan. Um, I think he would do it. I think he'd relish it, I, and I think he'd be great at it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll trust your judgment on that to say I, he's just. I don't really care who the person is as much as it is just somebody that it, you know installs kind of what you've talked about in terms of buy-in and understanding roles and how your role expands beyond just getting the ball in the hole. Right. Like that's, that seems to be a huge, huge gap for me. Um, and yeah, I, yeah. I, it, I, and it's not a question of if the players can do it or, or want to, you know, I think, is it a thing that, you know, Brooks wants to do, I would say no. Like he's right. a guy that's a really interesting player moving forward. 
does he fit the Ryder Cup model that a John Rahm, that a Rory, that a Justin Rose, they 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 bought in and laid into that. I don't see him doing that. He's a little bit more of an assassin. Yeah. Uh, but I I buy in the Scotty Shuffler taking in that role and saying, yes, I am capable of doing that. You just got to ask of him to do that. He's a young guy. Um, he hasn't experienced anything like that. He's only played the home ones. And he's like, this is great. This is fun. This is this is easy. And then when you go over there, you're like, oh, wow, this is – they don't want us to win. They're screaming at us and yelling at us, and, and they're happy. We That's a weird thing to experience. It is not normal in golf to experience those things. And you have to – I think and, – and you got to ask that of your top players and say, you know, as I said, I, I need you to be great, but I need you to be in charge. And you're in charge of this group. And anyone that's ever been a part of any team anywhere, including yeah. work environments, like for, for us, like going, if I look back in time, um, there was, there was four of us that were full time back in 2018 and, and Neil didn't go full time until 2019. And we were like, you know, we were doing okay in 18, but we were all kind of swimming in our own lanes. And I wouldn't, we, I don't know if we were, you know, sometimes not swimming in the same direction. And when Neil came on board full time, he became like the leader of the group and it, it enhanced my performance because I had almost somebody I owed reporting to or something of here's what I'm responsible for. Here's what I need to like. It was, it changed everything. And that wasn't going to happen without somebody taking leadership and ownership of that part of the process. Right. And we've all been much more productive since then and have evolved since from that. And that's where it's like, there has to flow through someone that's willing to like organize everything. And yeah. I don't know, I had, I had faith that that was going to be the case. What did you, what did you make of the pay for play uh, stuff? Was this ever talked about when when you were on any Ryder Cup teams, or uh, you know, do you think that was a distraction at all to the U.S. team? Yeah, I mean, I, I opened my big mouth years ago and, and got a lot of flack for it, um, talking about um, some of the. Uh, I think Mark Amira and, and Duvall were some of the early guys to time to talk about it, and I talked about it to a guy, um, uh, and it was the wrong place, the wrong time. What, what I said, I'd never met him part of a team so it was my own you know uh negligence and, and being stupid and young um but it's a real thing in terms of this is a big event there's 24 of us playing uh, they're making a lot of money off the event i think i think what just you just want a little bit of transparency and to tell us what we're doing how we're getting reciprocated for our efforts and, and our product that we're putting out there. And where is the money going? Cause I know, cause it's not like it just goes in someone's pocket. I mean, it, it funds the PGA of America. It funds all their junior programs and it funds everything that they do. It's just, you just want a little transparency when you, you don't know where it's going and it feels like you're being taken advantage of a little bit. Right. And so it has come to, you know, players get it for the charity. Um, and that's great. I think, I think it just needs transparency is, is, what I would go back to and just say, hey, PJ Ramirez should come in and talk to the players and say, hey, this is this is um, where it goes, how we do. Um, these are the things we do for you. And just kind of lay it out so it's a little bit, you have a better understanding of it. I think when you just sort of show up and do it um, and you see the size of the tents and you see the merchandise and you see all that stuff, oh, yeah. you do feel like, wait a minute, am I getting my sort of fair share? And I know people talk about, you know, uh, you get bonuses. And I get that. And in any business, when you work, you want to get, you know, you want to get your money for the work that you do. So um, I, I don't mind the players asking the question. I just think a little transparency, a little understanding of what's happening, where it's going. And I think, honestly, as we all were, we're like, we're on board with that. And that's totally fine. We're good. We're good. But um, um, I think it was a problem this year. And I think that was sort of substantiated afterwards. Like it was an issue. It was not when, when not everyone is truly there and bought in and, and ready to go and is there to kind of uh, just be there. Um it's not a great feeling, right? You're you're going against a giant who's all in. Right. And when we talked about, we just spent a long time talking about. They're all in, and you're not all in. And they're some of your best players, and and they're, they play together, and you don't really. 
but there are also two guys where you see out there playing, you're like, well, who else do I pair with them? Are they the guys that I ask to sort of help take charge? I mean, Patrick's awesome. He's a, he's, he's, he's in that Brooks mold, right? Where they're just, they're a little bit better individuals than they are sort of part of a group. It's sort of the reality of it. Yeah. Because Brooks is, he's, he's an assassin. He's a killer. He's nasty. Like he's just going to like in singles, he just mows you down, you know, and Patrick's sort of the same way, but like these guys aren't wrapping their arms around Wyndham and saying, yeah. Hey brother, just lean on me all day. If you have any problems, if you have any questions, like Justin Leonard, when I play with him, he just like, I just leaned on him that whole week. And and, and I didn't, I played with Phil um, Saturday afternoon and he came up to me and just hugged me and said, I'm going to be here all day with you. If you ever need anything, you ever have a question, I'm right here. Right. That's leadership. And that's like, not what you see from the U S side. You see bonding, but you don't see a guy wrapping their arms around a window and saying, bro, I got you. I got you. I'm going to talk you through this all day. I'm going to be with you all day. I'm going to like, just, you know, you're just like a, like a taking care of a puppy. Like you're just, you know, you're just feeding them confidence, feeding them energy. It's like, we just didn't have that. Right. It just, you know, it just, it, it, you know, and I, and part of that is just, you're just not, asking the guys you're just not asking them of that and then i think honestly when you build your team next time you're, you got to take that into consideration like who are my dudes who are going to yeah. take care of the other guys like that's a real thing to ask and uh, that's different on u.s territory than europe as well i think totally. like, like when you well, come, the guys you would pick right yes and yeah. yeah you need those guys over there you need those 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 guys to just help the group and inspire everyone and just be like hey you know, because like Phil would always come out and say, give me the young guys. Give me the young guys. Give me Keegan. Give me Keegan. Give me Hunter. Right. I got him. I'm going to I'm just going to I'm just going to coast them along all day. I'm going to talk to them. We're going to have a great time. Right. Like there's not many guys that are doing that. Like, you know, that's why I do think Tiger is going to be a good leader. He, he does. that. He just does it in his own way. Right. But he's going to take a military uh, sort of like a militaristic approach of uh, of groups and of common goal. But we're all going to do it a little differently, and that's okay because the goal is to win. The goal is not to bond. The goal is to find our little groups, and you're going to do it different than this guy. So I'm going to put you with him, right? It might be different than you think, but it, it's going to work, right? It's going to work, and, and you're going to trust me because this is a master plan over time, not a um, of a week. Yeah, I promise we'll wrap this eventually, but uh, it's just it, it feels like they – what you just described takes pressure off players. Like you're playing an environment that is unfamiliar to anything else you're going to play in your entire yeah. professional career. And like anything you can do to take the pressure off of that situation. And, and, and uh, that's why I've said a lot is it just seems like the U S players by their on their, in their own way of wanting to win very badly. I, I do not sure. question the desire of that. No, it's not. A, yes. It's but not they a, almost, it's almost like an American nature to like want to take that on and want to be as tough as possible, want to take on that burden. And just at, you're adding a layer of pressure to yourself instead of a layer of, you know, kind of uh, not spreading that out, but almost like understanding not to put too much on yourself and playing for 12 people instead of just trying to dominate on your own performance can, can lead to a totally different success level of golf. I don't know. It's, it's, so what makes it the best event, dude? I don't know. It's it's the it's my favorite to just continually talk about. It. Might be saying the same things over and over, but it, it really is that interesting. But it's so complex. There's a lot of complexity to it, right? And and you have to respect that complexity and that, and that understanding. And I think the the European side understands it um, heavily. They understand the psyche and the motivational, and you know, they they knew what they had on their team. And they usually do a good job of of pumping up like the, the the bottom guys used to be we always thought it was their their sort of their their kryptonite their problem but they've done a good job of taking those guys and taking them with like a justin rose right and and, and justin's like i'm gonna getting I'm the gonna most out of them they get something out, out of them squeeze it out of them so by sunday instead of just saying you're not gonna play till sunday no we're, we are gonna play you because we believe in you, we have confidence. We're going to give you a Justin Rose, who's also a guy you wouldn't really truly expect to wrap your arms around somebody. But he was a master that weekend, did a masterful job of just 
just squeezing all the juice out of them and squeezing all that that you know you could see it in their faces all that um that tension and that nervousness and he just got it out of them to where i'm drawing a blank on who he played with but he was Robert mcintyre mcintyre made huge putts played yeah. great great when i watched him tee off on uh, it was friday i'm like this is gonna i don't know what we're gonna get out of him man by sunday the dude the guy was he was massive on sunday uh, saturday afternoon made some huge huge shots so um that's what you want to see is that 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 process grow throughout the week and and they did a masterful job of it is I'm willing to I've long believed like the US has an advantage in the fact that they play the President's Cup in between Ryder right. Cups and I'm I'm willing to uh, listen to a theory or float a theory that it might actually hurt like I, one how do you explain the US's domination in the President's Cup and and lack of success in the Ryder Cup at least on on road games and two can that add to a level of complacency of you know, we don't need to upend our process. We've got a good thing going. We win everywhere. We win the U.S. Ryder Cups at home. We win the President's Cup everywhere. We just lose one of these every four years. And uh, is there any complacency that can be gained from the success of the President's Cup teams? Um, that's not a crazy idea. I think, you know, we had – the one thing we've had is consistency um, with Fred, right? I mean, we had Jack for a while, and then um, – and then, you know, Arnold, I think Arnold was the guy who started it. And then, but if you had Fred forever and ever and ever and ever. So you had the same consistent guy there. And Fred's about the easy, most easygoing guy you'd ever want to be around. And, um, you know, I, I have had some uh, bad pairings. I remember playing with Snedeker one year. And um, I love Brandt, but we could play in completely different ways. And we were not a good pairing. It was just, he, he gets the more energized he gets, the more pumped up he gets, the better he plays. I'm sort of the opposite. Like, I can't play at his speed and his energy. It just doesn't work, right? Uh, but we were able to still win that that President's Cup um, because I, I I think there's such a lack of um, stress. You know, Fred just doesn't allow that in his life. And so there's just never – you just had all this confidence and all this this, this history of – well, we're going to pull it out. We're going to, we'll find a way and we'll play well and, and do it. And, and the reality for that side is they don't even speak the same language. I mean, they have a, that is a, that is a hard task over there of what they have to do. And and I hope that the emergence of some of those younger guys um, helps because, um, you know, Tom Kim and stuff could maybe be the future of, of, of that, but they have a really hard task. I mean, it's not easy at all to what, you know, you know what Trevor had to do is, is to get these guys to communicate and to sort of work together. That that is really really hard. But for us to have the same consistent messaging, the same kind of guy, and just kind of keep it going. You know, I know he doesn't do it anymore, but like it's that helps so so much. And he's such a good, and he leans. But he leaned on. You know, I remember being in and I was eating after one. Um, I was just eating in the hotel and like Fred, Phil, and Tiger walked in. And I'm I'm just like, and all of a sudden they just start chatting about the next pairings, about what we're gonna do. And I'm in there like, should I be in here? I like <laughs> I left. And then they asked my opinion. And I'm like, I don't know. I think it sounds pretty good to me, whatever you guys think. Um, but he leaned heavily on Tiger and he leaned heavily on Phil. And like, what do you guys feel? What do you guys see out there? What you know? And so there was this um there was still ownership of those top players to understand what was going on and had a pretty good pulse of the team and, and what everyone was feeling. Um, but it was just that the, there was such a easy goingness about what we were doing and how we were playing that week that it was such a it's such a different vibe than playing in the Ryder Cup and especially playing you know across the pond. Last one, I promise, uh, and we'll let you go. But I just got back from Royal Melbourne um, at the Asia Pacific Amateur. Was the 2011 Presidents Cup just like peak golf? Like, is that like the most fun you could uh, playing team golf on that golf course and match play in those conditions has to just be the most fun it could possibly be. Yeah, especially coming off like my my 2010 experience and then having to get back in a team event, they were letting me have it over there. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah, and so making that putt um, against Jason Day and Aaron Badley to kind of win the match was one of the best feelings I've ever, ever had. And those are fans who are golf starved and they love it. They've had an incredible history of incredible players. So, and that golf course is historic and it's incredible. That whole section, um, sort of the sand belt there is just awesome, awesome golf. So 
Um, that was, and knowing that they had won before, there was extra motivation um, on our side. There was motivation on their side. Um, Norman being the captain, like all of a sudden it felt like everything was lining up for them. Jason Day was becoming a real top player in the world, an Australian stud. So all these things were lining up in their favor. And I think that really motivated us and really made us know, you know, it kept you on your toes that week and like, hey, we can't can't get behind these matches because they could run away from us. Um, and I think everyone kind of, you know, I had a great partner in Tom's and, and David and I just played awesome. We just kind of smoked everybody that week. And um, it was a great, that was a great, great win and great experience because that was, that was tough. That was, that was real, real challenging. And um, that was an incredible, incredible feat. And the fans were, they were the perfect balance of, of um, on their side, but also appreciative of, golf and the entertainment and we all sort of made up at the end <laughs> i think it should just be the international president cup should just be there every year i really i really do think I, it does it, feel like that i don't know it's magic it is magic it is it is you know it's a challenge to go to other places for for that side but you know um the south african was obviously incredible um you know you'd love to see it all over the world um but there's something magical about that, right? It's like St. Andrews. It's like, why isn't that every three years instead of like five? And it's like, no, no, that thing needs to be there all the time. I mean, yeah. that thing is just, it's the coolest. It's the best. So, all right, man, we can do this anytime you want. I absolutely love talking golf with you. And I love, uh, you know, uh, I, my campaign stickers for you to be uh, uh, involved in the U.S. Ryder Cup team process are arriving at some point. I'll have them shipped out um, all over the country. Perfect. So Perfect. You could be wearing Hunter Mayhem for Ryder Cup. So uh, great talking golf with you. Appreciate your time and we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, man.